You see, I love cats, but this long-standing affection of mine does not obscure the fact that each of them has a brain the size of a walnut and less common sense than a teenager after a couple of beers. Firstly, as a child, I never thought or wanted to have a cat. When I was growing up, our family never had pets, and constantly caring for any kind of them seemed like hard and pointless work to me. But one day, for some reason, my ex-girlfriend decided that we needed a cat, but I wanted to have sex with her, so I agreed. Then we broke up and she moved somewhere that didn't allow pets, and I ended up stuck with this beast. It was a tabby cat that destroyed everything in my house in no time. As much as I wanted to hate him, when he snuggled up to me at night and purred like a warm, fuzzy little motor, well, I couldn't be angry anymore. What a manipulative little asshole he is. Eventually he got sick and I had to put him down. By that time I realized that I liked these purrs and got a couple of kittens, a brother, and a sister. This was before I met my current wife. Both cats were completely black. Only the female had blue eyes and the male had green eyes. In addition, the male was larger, but had a calmer character. Unlike him, my sister was very energetic and cocky. Since they were both pure black, they needed witch names, so I chose Hermione and Hagrid. The names, as they say, matched their personalities. I never considered using the nickname Harry. I'm not going to argue, but I think it's a stupid name for a cat. The same can be said about Ron or Weasley especially for a cat without red fur. Of course, their real names didn't matter when I growled on both of them, like enough or lie down, not that they ever responded to my commands or were quick to obey. No, although these fidgets preferred my company, they always remained on their own minds. But as I said, my wife didn't like cats. She pretended to tolerate them while we were dating and engaged, but after we got married, she tried to get me to get rid of them. I refused, and this dispute became the first big quarrel between us. I eventually prevailed, but her passive-aggressive behavior in the marriage began soon after. I must face the fact that I was probably somewhat responsible for this situation. The thing is, in the middle of our fight, my wife Randy told me that she didn't like cats because, when she was a child, she read a story about some crazy old cat lady who died of a sudden heart attack. The lady was a recluse and by the time it occurred to anyone to check on the grandmother, ten of her cats, mad with hunger, attacked the most obvious source of meat in the area. As a result, a panicked fear took root in my wife's soul that one day the same thing might happen to her, when for some reason I was suddenly not at home. This story obviously grew out of the same irrational childhood fears that we all have, and Randy's telling of it reflected her deep trust in me. My subsequent hysterical laughter and condescending comment that her fear was stupid and baseless, in retrospect, did not help overcome her phobia, but only angered Randy. Well, I'm sorry, it probably wasn't one of my most emotionally supportive moments in our married life. In the end, we both apologized. I acknowledged the depth of her fear and assured my wife that I would feed the animals well, so there would be no problem. She expressed the hope that she would learn to live with them. Days, weeks, and months flew by, and I still thought that her fears were sheer nonsense. Over time, it became obvious that Randy had lied about my cats. So, her favorite pastime was to leave the front door ajar and pretend that it happened by accident, in the hope that our black furry samurai would one day run away and never return. That way, she probably thought, the problem would solve itself. You see... I kept cats inside the house because I was convinced they would be killed or maimed outside, given the tiny cat brains the size of walnuts. Randy apparently proved me wrong. In some amazing way, either gods or saints, the righteous ones, looked after Hagrid and Hermione, because after an hour of frantically running around the yard and puzzling climbs and somersaults through the trees along the sides of the house, they became bored and they returned home to eat and then curl up in a ball or lie down anywhere and sleep without hind legs. Everything changed after I started watching videos on Instagram. I've seen these videos taken from cameras mounted on collars that cats wear. I think you probably watch them too. I thought it was funny and decided to do the same with my blacktails. I usually let my cats go outside whenever I get home from work, 
right after I put collars with miniature video cameras on them. My little tigers always liked to climb trees and hide there for a while. Then they went down and began to chase each other in circles or other intricate trajectories. Both cats were accustomed to this daily routine and, as a result, never went outside, even when my wife deliberately left the doors open. The cat's reflex was this. It's not time for us to go out, because the owner, that is me, is not in the house. And besides, we were not wearing collars with these things. If any of these conditions were not met, Hermione and Hagrid did not show their noses over the threshold, and they were usually only gone for about an hour, and then quickly returned home when I loudly called them back. I could tell that the failure of Randy's cunning plans to accidentally get the cats out of the house was driving my wife crazy every day, but I pretended not to notice. When the cats returned home, I filmed them and took the cameras, which were wireless and connected to my phone, and then downloaded video, edited short videos, and posted them on social networks. I know, I know, it seems like pretty stupid content, but I already had half a million subscribers who liked my cat videos, so it all amused the hell out of me. Something about seeing their paws flash in camera shots as they ran, seeing the world around them from a cat's point of view, framed by their furry chins and shaking whiskers, and heard their purring, hissing, meowing, and sometimes musical roulades. Every time it made me laugh, sometimes right to tears. My subscribers, too, were touched and were delighted with these cat videos, judging by their comments and thousands of likes. The company where I purchased the mini cameras for my cats liked the massive advertising of their products and upgraded my gadgets to the newest and most advanced models for free, provided that I use them regularly. The other day, I returned home early from work. It was snowing in our area, with several inches falling by mid-afternoon. Reports of expected increased rainfall were everywhere, and for this reason I was not worried about getting there, because many people didn't bother to go to work at all. What really excited me was that my cats had never seen snow before. The last few winters have been warm and almost snowless. The thought of a video of black beasts frolicking in white snow made me giddy with adrenaline in anticipation of how hilarious the video I could film and post online. Upon arrival, it turned out that for some reason my wife was not at home, which came as a slight surprise to me since her car was in the garage. I knew that her office, like many others, was closed due to bad weather. Randy worked for a government agency, and when I was driving home, I heard a radio. Announcement announcing the early closure of most government offices in our area. Where could she have gone? Hagrid and Hermione didn't greet me at the door, which was also quite unusual. Having driven the car into the garage, I decided to look for them before trying to find out where my wife was. The reason the cats didn't come to the garage door was because they were sitting side by side, staring out the window, mesmerized by the softly falling flakes of snow behind it. I gave them the signal, one of the few verbal commands they would respond to, and they immediately ran to the front door to put on their camera collars. After equipping the cats with their devices and turning on the recording, I opened the door, and Hermione carefully poked her head outside, sniffing and looking around at the unusual surroundings. The more impatient Hagrid jumped over her because she was too slow and immediately crashed into the all-encompassing white carpet, passing with a surprised May a little forward and leaving behind a darkening trail of four cat protectors. Hermione watched the brave trailblazer for a couple of seconds and then shook her head in the feline equivalent of saying, Ah, screw it all, and jumped after him. The crazed cats had a full-blown explosion of ecstatic excitement in our front yard. They ran in circles and weaved along unpredictable trajectories with crazy pewter eyes, gliding on spreading paws, funny flopping on their side and jumping up again. They jumped with acceleration into the snow drifts, realizing that the snow was cold and wet, and then quickly forgot about it during the game. I made myself a cup of coffee and watched them tumble for a while. Watching this circus live, laughing at the cat somersaults, was much better than on TV. After about 15 minutes, the cats apparently got tired of chasing each other, and one after another they climbed up a tree located between our house and the neighbor's house. 
I knew from experience that they would be there, resting, for some time. By the way, about this. I didn't like our neighbor. First of all, his name was Goose. Strictly speaking, Gus, but that doesn't matter. This Goose was a general contractor who had just renovated his own home. Frankly, after the renovation, his house looked pretty nice, so we talked to him about doing a similar renovation to our house, too. Secondly, our neighbor was a fit and muscular guy, and he always liked to flirt with Randy, who would giggle every time, languidly straighten her hair, stick her chest out, and flirt back. When I confronted her about this, she indignantly denied all my accusations, calling them outrageous insinuations, and at the same time added that I cling to her only because I am not confident in myself. Third, this goose was also a cyclist fanatic, and a particularly obnoxious type at that, who at every opportunity ranted about his watts, amperage, volts, calories, and his next race, in each of which he intended to take the top prize. He liked to ride his bike along the canal embankment near our house, even in the worst weather, when it was slippery and muddy, because, as he said to my wife's stupidly suggestive giggle, what's the point of doing something if it doesn't make you dirty? But I got a little distracted while finishing my cup of coffee. Just then, Randy returned. Where are the cats? Without saying hello, the first thing she did was ask a question, and in a somewhat tense tone. It was strange. Randy never asked about them, and now she seemed quite excited. Taking a closer look at my wife, I realized that she looked very disheveled, as if she had to quickly get dressed. Her hair, usually carefully styled, was now in such disarray as if she had just woken up, or she slid out of the hayloft head down. Outside, I answered, watching her. She behaved suspiciously, insecurely, and her gaze slid, without lingering, on the kitchen items, while trying not to meet mine. She seemed to not know what words to choose and what to say next. Suddenly, like a cat, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end with a premonition of something very bad. Why? I asked briefly. She almost jumped and looked shocked, but quickly managed to pull herself together. What why? She answered, still avoiding looking at me. Why are you asking about cats? She seemed to relax slightly, leaning back and leaning her back against the wall. Well, I was worried about them in this weather, she said, looking into my eyes for a second, but then quickly looked away. Now I knew she was lying. What she wanted was for them to get stuck in the snow and freeze to death in this weather. Where have you been? I rolled an oncoming test ball. She began to look scared again, and her features tensed again. It was as if I could see the wheels in her head spinning madly as Randy frantically tried to figure out what to say to her. She even seemed to shrink a little, standing against the wall and frantically clutching herself with her arms under her chest. I went to Gus's house to discuss with him the renovations we want to do. She finally gave her final version. She glanced sideways at me to see how I would react. My instincts told me that there was more behind her words than she wanted to imagine. Randy looked close to panic now. Given all the clues I'd noticed earlier that my brain was slowly processing, I could only think of one reason why she looked so twitchy. And I realized that the reason could be directly related to our cats. I just remembered that they not only like to climb the tree next to Goose's house, but they also like to jump from that tree to the roof of his veranda and walk around. Usually this was nothing special, because when they went on their excursions, most often he was not at home. On the other hand, there were a few occasions when I had to carefully edit the cat camera footage, because it showed right into his bedroom as they walked past it on the roof of the neighbor's porch. Please tell me, honey, were you upstairs or downstairs at Gus's house? I asked, looking into her instantly flushed face. The pendulum on the grandfather clock in the corner managed to click three times before she answered, holding her breath. It's... it's not what you think. How do you know what I'm thinking about? Was the next logical question on my part. Randy nervously licked her suddenly dry lips, her eyes darting around the room. 
but there was no answer. Then I took the initiative. I think I'll bring the cats back into the house. I'm guessing they'll be bringing a really interesting video here today. Randy's eyes widened, but again she said nothing, only swallowed and opened and closed her mouth several times. I went out onto the porch after making sure that the main part of my body remained in the doorway so that I would not be, purely by accident, locked from the outside. Kitties! Om nom nom! I called loudly into the space of the courtyard. When I started using this command, I said the words while loudly shaking a box of dry cat food. They quickly received the message and ran back home. Then, when they came in and allowed me to remove the cameras from their necks, I treated each of them to a well-deserved treat. After that, I gave them their usual portions of food. Over time, I stopped using the noisy stimulus just to get their attention, but still gave them a treat for following the command, and then fed them some time later. So today, they reacted the same way they always did, and rushed to the door when they heard my call. I made sure to remove the cameras from their collars before they went inside so Randy wouldn't try to grab them. After handing out treats at the door, I let the cats inside. They shook themselves up, scattering lumps of snow stuck to their fur, froze for a couple of seconds, looking warily at Randy, who had frozen in the corridor, and then slipped further into the house. I closed the front door. Randy's gaze was drawn to both cat cameras that I held in my hand. Finally, she looked up and her gaze met mine. She looked somehow crestfallen, and a hunted expression froze on her face. I go down to the basement to download the video and decide what I want to publish on the internet. I hope you can figure out something to do with yourself, I told her. I turned around and went down the stairs to my den. To hell with it, I'll feed the cats later. It took a while for the app on my phone to sync with the cameras, but after a quick five-minute scroll through the footage, I found what I suspected. There was a video of Goose having sex with Randy on the bed in the bedroom on the second floor of his house, which was clearly visible from the roof of the veranda, and in the video their faces were clearly visible, Randy's moaning mouth and her eyes closed in ecstasy. At some point, she opened them and realized that she was looking straight into Hermione's eyes, of course not knowing which cat of the two it was, her eyes widened, she quickly jumped off the bed and rushed to the window in all her naked glory. Quick-witted Hermione was catapulted back onto the tree in an instant and quickly climbed down. When a half-dressed Randy rushed out of the house a few minutes later, trying to catch up with the black witness to her fall from grace, she instead chased peacefully those who moved out over a snowdrift by Hagrid, not even suspecting that he was chasing the wrong cat. The astonished Hagrid, who was not doing anything at all, took his legs in his paws just in case, accelerated and soared up the tree like a rocket. Hermione, hiding on the sidelines, saw how Randy, carried away in pursuit, rushed past and slipped into a secluded place under Goose's veranda, where he had a lot of different rubbish lying around. Randy never noticed her, stomping around under the tree in impotent irritation, her head raised while Hagrid above meowed mockingly at her, wagging his tail. At the end of the video, an angry Randy was seen returning to our house after chasing two cats, but not catching either. And the second best part of each video was that they both clearly showed that Randy was in perfect physical condition before I went down to the basement. There were no marks or scratches on her at that moment. I purposely left both cameras on when I took them off the cats and held them in my hands in such a way as to capture Randy's face and body. The cats and I were not going to get any accusations of domestic violence from her in the divorce, since it seemed inevitable. After a while, I heard the patter of footsteps up the stairs and quickly climbed from the basement to the second floor, this time keeping my phone camera on. I was just in time to take another picture of Randy, showing that there were no marks on her face or visible parts of her body, when she pulled her hastily packed suitcase out of the bedroom, grabbed her coat, and walked out the front door without saying a word. As she left, she just gave me one last guilty look before the door slammed behind her. I followed her out, continuing to record, and filmed her in the car, slowly leaving backing out of the driveway onto the snowy road. 
she was probably heading to her mother's house. However, it later turned out that I was fundamentally mistaken about how the divorce would work when I spoke about abuse. A couple of days after I caught Randy cheating, or more accurately, after my cats caught her, I returned home after taking care of some urgent matters, including a meeting with a divorce lawyer, and found a police car waiting outside my house. The sheriff's deputy gave me a copy of the court order that prohibited me from coming within 100 feet of my own home. As it turned out, Randy's personal lawyer ruefully told the judge that Randy feared for her life because I had threatened her. Fucking Goose was also with them, presenting his sworn affidavit in support of her allegations, claiming that he had heard my threats with his own ears. What does such a small perjury mean between such close friends? After some negotiation with the sheriff's deputy, I received a black trash bag filled with my clothes thrown out on the porch from Randy. When I tried to take my personal computer and cat cameras, she told the officer that I had already taken them with me. When I wanted to take Hagrid and Hermione out of the house, Randy said that they belonged to her, that she loved them madly, and that if I was going to claim them, she would fight me for her favorite cats, with the help of her lawyers. The deputy commented to me that our matter was now in the realm of an ordinary civil case for trial. I knew better than to argue with her or the cop, so I just took what I could carry with me and left. I have no idea what Randy thought she was getting at by taking my electronics, because incriminating her video was already on the cloud server. This was probably some kind of tactical move or a demonstration of one's own superiority with her sides. I was much more worried about my cats being left in her hands. I called my lawyer and asked him to check if the charges against me were valid. It turned out that no criminal action had been filed against me for allegedly abusing Randy, so I simply had to file a complaint in court to have the restraining order lifted and my belongings taken back. That's exactly what the deputy was saying, although the lawyer told me that by the time we got in front of the judge, the two-week restraining order would have expired on its own. Also, my lawyer warned me that the entire divorce process would be negative and would take forever, especially if Randy tried to drag it out, but that he would soon begin preparing to feel for divorce anyway. The lawyer also said he would make sure to somehow remove the cats from the home or at least have animal control check on their current condition, but he wasn't too optimistic that anyone would or will actually do so in the near future. In the meantime, I reached my mother's house and temporarily settled down with her, deciding to wait there for a while. I thought about posting the video of Randy and Goose on Instagram or YouTube, but my lawyer warned me that by doing so, well, it's enter into revenge porn territory, and that I would prefer not to have to deal with that level of escalation. It also distracted us from the divorce case, so I was thrown out of my own home on Friday. It snowed heavily that weekend and into the following week, keeping many government offices, including the courts, closed much of the time. At that time, the district court did not yet accept electronic filings, so my lawyer could not file a divorce complaint until the government offices were restored. This weather chaos also meant that for about 10 days, we were unable to file anything in court to challenge the restraining order. I called animal control to check on my cats, but based on the conversation, they weren't making a visit to my old home a priority, especially since the damn snowdrifts continued to disrupt traffic in the city. Apparently, I had to come to terms with the fact that Randy was probably going to do something bad to the cats if they weren't already starving to death. Just the thought that there was nothing I could do to somehow prevent this felony genocide made me furious. Things got off the ground the following Friday when the landline telephone in her kitchen began to ring at my mother's house. The call was from Randy. I blocked her number on my cell phone and my mother's phone was an old model, which did not allow me to determine who was calling. My mother had just left the house during one of the breaks in the snowfall. I just wanted you to know that Gus and I have been having sex in our bed all the time since you left. My wife's gloating voice came over the phone when she heard that I answered the call. I really wanted to record her call, but my cell phone had run out of battery, and besides, it was in another room upstairs anyway. I was about to hang up when I heard frantic meowing in the background. Somehow, Hermione and Hagrid were still alive. 
I was puzzled by how they managed this with a mistress of the house who hated them with every fiber of her being. Oh, can you hear that? Well, yes, of course. You didn't even care about sex and me as much as you did about your cats. You always loved them more than me. Well, don't worry. I figured out how to solve this problem. I haven't fed these tailored devils since you were thrown out of the house at my request. A whole week without food. Ha ha, poor cats, she sang into the phone with mocking ridicule. They are so desperate that they finally came out to talk to me instead of hiding who knows where. That's great. I'm going to give them something to eat. I have a box of rat poison here, so I'll put some in my tuna cans. And then I'll say that, oh my God, it was all a terrible, terrible and accidental mistake. But those nasty black creatures won't be lurking around and spying for you anymore when the job is done. Suddenly, the meowing seemed to become louder and more angry. There were clearly low, threatening notes in the cat's purring, and Randy suddenly had no interest in me. Hey, stop it! Stand! Lie! Back off! No! I Get off my leg! Damn animals! No! Oh! Oh! Then, for some time in the tube, there was a cacophony of sharp hissing, cat squeals, the sounds of desperate female screams and screams, mixed with a catfight, the culmination of which was a strong fractional roar. After this, there was a ringing silence. I blew into the phone a couple of times, nothing except some barely audible rustle. Finally, after about a minute or two, I heard a strangled, pained groan. Then Randy's trembling voice asked, Are you still here? Yes, but I'm sorry that you didn't have a complete Karachan, I sincerely admitted. Those things, they attacked me, Randy moaned, and her voice was filled with undisguised shock at such betrayal. All arrogance and bravado evaporated, as if they had never existed. They saw a can of cat food in my hand and jumped at me from both sides, digging their claws into it. I think I threw them off, but they didn't calm down. God, what scary eyes they have. They attacked again, and we... Oh, oh, I tried to fight, and then, then... I probably stopped and, and rolled down the steps to the basement. Whoa. Oh, what a shameful defeat, I commented sarcastically. The national team of cats defeats Randy with a score of 2 so. You, you should call 911, she meowed. Call yourself. I, I can't, she whimpered. Her voice sounded helpless. Why not? I think, oh, I think I broke my back. I can't move my arms or legs. And I, oh, oh, damn. I can't even turn my head. I don't know where the phone is. Apparently, she was talking on speakerphone on a phone that was lying somewhere nearby. You know, I would love to, but I'm a little busy right now. I'm doing some laundry, and then I'll need to fold my things neatly. Otherwise, everything will change, and I like order, you know. Please. There was despair in her voice. Maybe Gus can help you? He always seemed to be there when you needed him, I suggested. She began to sob and then suddenly squealed. Lord God, the cats came closer and sniffed my face. Now she was in real panic. Are you bleeding there? I, yes, I think so. Uh-oh. The smell of blood will awaken some primal instincts, especially since you starved them for a week. I once saw something similar in Game of Thrones only it was with dogs. Cats seem to start with the nose, don't they? I thought out loud, pressing the telephone receiver to my ear with my shoulder. Then, they also seem to like ears, for a snack. I think, Randy, that your worst fears may yet come true. Oh my God, please help me. Help! Listen, Randy, you're obviously too busy right now. Maybe we can talk sometime later. After that, I hung up. Are you trying to poison my cats? Think again. Are you lying about me threatening you? Get out. Period. Moreover, you go to the left, not caring about marriage vows. After all this, I had absolutely no love left in me and no desire to help Randy. Now she was Mr. Goose's problem. At least I no longer had to worry about the cats starving to death. Or how many zeros a divorce will cost me. I was pleasantly surprised at how well I slept that night. Shortly before this, 
I had spoken to Dr. Marivers, whom I met online, about whether therapy would be a good idea, but he had this creepy accent that I had difficulty understanding. In fact, I wasn't even sure he had a license. In any case, talking to a real psychotherapist about such things could very well lead to me being locked up in an asylum. So this topic was definitely not discussed. However, posting things online seems to really help. I like to troll various assholes online. It's easy once you find their vulnerabilities and pain points. This allows me to release a lot of anger and negative tension. A couple of days later, I received a call from one of the animal control officers. It turned out that he was a longtime fan of my cats and the content I posted with them on my Instagram account. He realized he hadn't seen any posts for a while and put two plus two together. I explained to him that Randy and I were going through a pretty messy divorce and that she was starving my cats. For some reason, he did not know all the details in advance, but said that my information clarified the situation. This employee explained that later that fateful day, he stopped by my house to check on how the cats were doing. He could see them in the living room window, sitting in a column and constantly looking at him. In the basement window as he passed by, looking around the house in an attempt to find my wife so he could talk to her, he saw the legs of a man who did not seem to move. Then he called the police and paramedics, who arrived a short time later and broke down the front door. The animal control officer sadly informed me that it appeared that Randy was already dead by that time. He also suggested that I probably wouldn't want to have an open casket funeral for my ex-wife. Yes, the cats did a thorough job on it. No wonder, because they were very hungry and angry. Because of this, the identity of the deceased has not yet been reliably established. The fact is that they simply had nothing to work with, with the exception of teeth, and this kind of confirmation would take some time. After he told this chilling story, the bottom line was that animal control would most likely have to euthanize Hagrid and Hermione. True, to do this, they will have to find and catch these beasts. Because the minute the front door was broken open, both cats flew out of my house like two hypersonic missiles and flew up the tree onto the neighbor's roof. I thought that maybe I could intercept Hagrid or Hermione before anyone noticed given that all the responding services were fussing over my now-deceased wife. Keep in mind that I haven't yet decided whether I even want to continue living with these black predators now that they've rocketed to the top of the food chain, but I figured I'd think about it tomorrow, so I headed to my former home. Wanting to make this visit as discreet as possible, I left my phone at my mother's. There was no need for anyone to track my movements. My plan was to park on the far side of some tree-lined lot at the end of our street, then take a shortcut on foot and sneak into Goose's backyard, where I hoped I could get the cats off the roof. Alas, everything did not turn out quite as I expected. When I drove closer to our block, it was already well after noon, and the sun was setting. More snow has fallen in the area recently, keeping most people inside their homes. Looking out from behind a group of trees from my position, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't see my cats on the roof of our neighbor's house at all. However, I had a good look at the fact that there were still many police and fire trucks parked in front of my house. This was probably the most interesting death all month. Everyone who visits there will probably talk about it for years. Astonishing newcomers with this incredible story. I didn't see the point in trying to get close to my house, given the whole bunch of people trampled around him. So I gave up trying to find the escaped animals and walked back through the forest to the canal, walking a long way to get back to the car I left there. After heavy rainfall this week, snow was everywhere. Finally, I came to a place with a view of the canal aqueduct. It was built to carry the waters of the canal over a wide stream that flowed into the river nearby. Even in dry weather, it was always risky to ride a bicycle along the aqueduct because the path along it and next to the canal was very narrow. Instead, you had to walk along it, carrying your bike, as most locals did. Now, with fresh, plentiful snow cover, and perhaps hiding with ice underneath, the situation has likely become even more dangerous. Coming out from behind the trees and looking at the canal, I suddenly saw that my cats were on the aqueduct. They sat side by side on the edge and looked down at the water flowing in the stream.
I also realized that from the other side of the aqueduct, Goose was approaching on his bicycle. This bike fanatic was happily riding along the snow-covered footpath, about to cross the aqueduct and heading in my direction. However, to do this, he would have to drive past the cats, who were partially hidden from him by the railing and the fading light of the setting sun. At the last second, the cats noticed Goose, and Goose saw cats. They all reacted at the same time. The cats jumped out right in front of the bicycle, and Goose, who had gained momentum, reflexively jerked the steering wheel to the side and then slid along the ice. He crashed into the railing with acceleration, tumbled over the fence with his ass up, and flew down into the waters of the stream with a scream. His magnificent bicycle, rearing up, followed its owner, catching up and falling on his stupid head, just at the moment when he emerged and opened his mouth for air. Telephone Velo Goose, who I'm sure was recording the statistics of his races, also flew into the water in a graceful parabola and bubbled like a small fountain, like a silverfish. It sank to the bottom. As I ran up to the aqueduct, I saw the would-be Tour de France winner trying to rise from the bottom of the stream. The winter sun had almost set below the horizon, and it was already quite dark down there. The stream itself was not very deep, but the water in it turned out to be very cold, and Goose was obviously soaked in it from head to toe, and in addition, he apparently had a badly damaged leg on which he could not lean. His other problem was that the banks of the creek were very steep and icy, so there was really no way of getting out of sight, especially with his injured leg. He raised his head, saw me, and called for help. I couldn't make out what exactly he was screaming because the snow cover muffled his scream. In response, I shouted, Try again? Maybe you can call Randy for help? That's when he recognized me. He tried to climb onto the bank of the stream, but he failed and rolled back down. One thought occurred to me, and I decided that now I need to be somewhere else as soon as possible. I turned to head back to my car and saw both cats sitting on the path, staring at me without blinking. Their black mustachioed faces showed recognition, but all three of us somehow suddenly realized that from now on, we were going to go our own ways. After sitting for another minute, they stretched, snorting and bending gracefully, meowing something in their own, cat-like form, as a farewell, and they rushed towards the forest, where they soon disappeared from sight. I assumed that when they got tired of playing and exploring, they would return and hide in their hiding place under Goose's house. A few days later, when I returned to my house again, and after carefully removing other people's traces from the master bedroom and basement, and at the same time throwing away the bed, replacing it with a new one, I heard from a neighbor that some tourist had found a body, our former neighbor, on the bank of the creek. His limbs were frostbitten, and he died of hypothermia. They say that hypothermia kills quickly and painlessly, as if you were quietly and peacefully falling into sleep. Thinking about all this later, I could not understand why people always say that meeting a black cat is not good. Personally, I have always had good luck with them so far, although I think my next pet will be a rabbit, or better yet, a goldfish. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.